Thank you. I'm glad to be here. This is my first ELSI meeting in uh, DC. Um, so before I start, I would like to acknowledge the uh, contribution of all these awesome people here um, who, let's see, who actually contributed to this study and my funders, uh, mostly American Diabetes Association, Helmsley Foundation, and Glenn Foundation. Uh, so to put the talk in the context, let's think about 1900. That's when an average American, when he was born, the life expectancy was only 47 years. Only one in 100 could expect to live up to 90 years of age. One third of all babies died before the age of five. And the leading causes of death and disease was infectious disease, a microbial cause of disease. And that led to sanitation, vaccination, and antibiotics that saved life. And on an average, biomedical research extends lifespan uh, by three months for every one year of research. So by 2010, uh, the life expectancy at birth is 79 years, and one in four will live up to the age of 90. But the challenge is one third of all adults uh, suffer from at least one non-infectious chronic disease, and 80% of adults at the age of retirement is, have at least two chronic diseases. And that means they need treatment for at least one year or longer. And what has become clear is lifestyle contributes to disease risk. Uh, so here is an opportunity that we can actually target lifestyle to prevent this disease, just like we did for microbial agents. But actually, we don't know what is lifestyle. Um, so if I ask what is lifestyle, then there will be a lot of different answers. Uh, it starts from fruits and vegetables, eating low cholesterol diet, low fat diet, et cetera, et cetera, and then there will be no consensus. So the way we define what is lifestyle is lifestyle is what, when, and how much. We eat, sleep, and move on a daily basis. And if you put everything in this framework, actually a lot of things will fit into this framework. But what is interesting is this, let's see, how do we, um, this when aspect. Why I'm emphasizing so much on when? Because we actually have a timing system in our body and the best way to realize that is some of you who had the opportunity to go to bed around 9 or 10 last night, then your deep sleep, this will be fine now. And then just before you woke up, your body temperature began to rise to prepare you to wake up. And then as soon as you opened your eyes and then got some light, your melatonin level dropped, your cortisol level began to rise. And um, around 10 or 11 will be your high alertness, and the afternoon muscle performance will peak. That's the best time to exercise. And as evening goes on, your melatonin level will begin to rise, core body temperature begin to drop, and you'll go to sleep. So if you think about it, almost every organ in our body has to work in absolute synchrony to, to produce these daily rhythms in behavior, physiology, and metabolism. And over the last 20 years, this new science of circadian rhythm has given us uh, how this whole system works. And it can be summarized in a very simple slide like this. Uh, so light, mostly in the form of blue light, uh, goes through our eye and then activates or resets a clock that's present in the hypothalamus, or base of the brain. And this clock in turn sends various signals to clocks present in the rest of the body to produce daily rhythms in physiology, behavior, and metabolism. And a um, few years ago, we discovered a new light receptor um, that's present in the retina. And unlike rod and cones that help us to navigate the world, actually these light receptors don't do much to navigate the world. Now only 5,000 of those receptors in each of our eye. And these receptors are very interesting because they sense bright daylight that uh, resets our clock, raises our alertness, and reduces depression. At night time, although we can see perfectly fine in a dimly lit room, these light receptors are not that, uh, not that sensitive. So in that way, what happens is as we spend, we have spent a lot of our time evolutionarily with only firelight at evening time. So this light receptors turn off, sleep hormone melatonin begins to rise, and we go to sleep. But in modern days, what is happening is we spend a lot of time, most, almost 87% of our time, indoor, based on cell phone data. 
And during daytime, we are actually in gloomy indoor days. For example, the light here is around 200 to 300 lux. But if you just step outside, even if it's cloudy, it will be around 5,000 to 10,000 lux. So you can see how little light we get. And these blue light receptors are not that sensitive during daytime. So in that way, it reduces alertness, it promotes depression and mood disorders, and reduces performance, being stuck in a room like this for days and days. And at night time, when we have <laughs> bright LED light, that disrupts circadian rhythm, reduces sleep latency, uh, sorry, increases sleep latency, so we take a long time to go to bed, and it disrupts circadian rhythm. So the bottom line is light for vision is not the same as light for health, and we are doing a lot of work with architects and lighting engineers to uh, figure out what will be the ideal dynamic lighting indoor. But what is interesting is if you look at this nighttime map of the US and then think, okay, so these guys are getting circadian disruption through light, and if you peer into living rooms and kitchens, actually what people do is they watch TV and eat uh, all types of food. So then the question is, how much of circadian disruption comes from this light versus food? To make a long story short, a few years ago, almost uh, nine years ago, we discovered that actually light is not the biggest cue to the peripheral clock. All these peripheral clocks that are in the organs, uh, they actually get overridden by food cue. So that means eating at the wrong time resets all the peripheral clocks, whereas the brain clock is tied to light dark cycle. And that can cause internal desynchrony and lead to diseases. So um, to again give you some idea about how we look at this problem, we actually use mostly mouse as a model system. We put mice in this uh, light dark cycle, and then after a few days, uh, we, uh, we take the liver samples in almost every one hour, over 48 hours, and then ask how many genes turn on and off in a, on a daily basis. The bottom line is nearly 20% of our genes, only in the liver itself, turn on and off at different time of the day. So what you are seeing here is each line is one gene. When it's yellow, it turns on. When it's purple, it turns off. So that means, just imagine um, all the traffic lights in DC, they're turning on and off or going between green and red to make traffic flow smoothly. Imagine if they're stuck in red or if they're stuck in green, then uh, the traffic, there will be chaos. So similarly, we think that these rhythms actually help to coordinate metabolism. So basically, there are two major ways that the circadian rhythm or these rhythms or oscillation in gene expression or protein function or enzyme function help us. One is temporal separation of incompatible process. That means we cannot, for example, we cannot make fat and, and break down fat at the same time. Biochemically, they are incompatible. So that's why they are time to different time of the day. And then the second is, in many enzymatic pathways, in many metabolic pathways, there are 10, 20, or 30 different enzymes. And if they turn on and off at different time of the day, then you can accumulate intermediate toxic products that can cause internal harm. So having all this gene expressed in a synchrony actually helps to uh, increase what we call metabolic flux. So if we think that way, then we actually evolved with food mostly during daytime and fasting during nighttime. And the question is, is this continuous eating throughout day and night disrupts that metabolic efficiency and predisposes us to obesity, diabetes, etc. So as I told you, we are a basic science lab. We work with mostly mice. So we went back to mice, and then I'll give you why we think this way. So in nutrition research, if there are two major experiments that have driven nutrition research over the last 100 years, then the, those two are one, take identical set of mice, give one group of mice less calorie, those mice uh, live longer and have better health. So that led to counting calories and all these things about, about uh, counting calories that has been driving the economy for a very long time. The second experiment that actually again, was very influential is this. You take two groups of mice, genetically identical, give one set of mice standard diet, another set of mice high fat diet. We can substitute for high fructose, high, um, carb uh, high cholesterol, any kind of diet. And the bottom line is the second group of mice becomes unhealthy within nine to 10 weeks. They become obese, diabetic, and they are actually modeled for many diseases. There are 11,000 papers based on this high fat diet induced obesity. What is interesting is, if we look at the eating pattern of mouse on a standard diet, they mostly eat at night because these are nocturnal animals. But 
mice on high fat, high fructose, high sucrose diet, they actually split their diet 50-50 between day and night. So as a result, what happens is the circadian clock or the gene expression rhythms in liver, in uh, heart, and all these metabolic organs are very robust in standard diet-fed mice, whereas in high-fat diet-fed mice, they become dampened. So the question we asked is how much of this is, how much of the disease is due to diet versus eating pattern? So now, I'll give you some example or summarize how uh, at least the mouse metabolism or to some extent human metabolism works throughout day and night. For example, if a person eats three meals a day and as soon as we eat breakfast, our body actually turns into a, a carb burning mode. So we are mostly using carb from readily available sugar in our, um, in our meal throughout the day. And during this time, um, our actually fat burning is pretty low. And as fasting goes on, then we switch from sugar to fat. So now imagine if I take the same three meals and then spread it over a longer period of time, then what happens is uh, the switch from sugar burning to fat burning will take longer time or will be delayed, and it will not be enough for fat burning to come to full speed. So now if we compare them side by side, you can see if somebody or a mouse is eating, say, 10 hours every day and versus 15 hours every day, then you can see a slight difference in fat burning and over days or over weeks, that can actually have significant effect. So to test this hypothesis, we did a very simple experiment. Uh, we took genetically identical set of mice, even from the same vivarium, from the same room, so they have the same microbiome to begin with. One set of mice got a high fat diet at Livitum, so they can eat whenever they want. The second set of mice were actually trained to eat the same number of calories from the same food source um, only within eight hours every night in the first experiment. We did this for 18 weeks. Every week the mice were where the food was where to make sure that they ate the same number of calories. At the end of 18 weeks, this is what we find, that the mice that ate within eight hours, they were 28% less and they had 72% or 70% less adiposity. If we looked at their when we looked at the liver, then these mice on high fat ad libitum were uh, filled with fat, whereas the mice on time restricted feeding, what we call, were pretty healthy. And in fact, if we just compare the liver sections from normal diet fed mice and high fat time restricted, you cannot see the difference. So that was the extent of difference. And to go back, actually the experiment had four different cohorts. There were also mice with normal chow ad libitum and normal chow time restricted, and high fat ad libitum, high fat time restricted, and all these four groups of mice ate the same number of calories, and they had similar pattern of activity throughout day and night. The only difference was in their weight. And we actually went ahead and did very thorough biochemical analysis of this liver at different time of the day, um, and basically the bottom line is if we measured, say, 300 metabolites from this liver um, between any two groups, for example, even if we give normal chow at libitum or time restricted, 15% of liver metabolites were changing significantly between groups, even on normal diet. And on high fat diet, nearly 40% of metabolites change just based on timing of food intake. And most of these metabolites that changed, this is the heat map representation, and you can see these two groups actually change the most, sugar and nucleotide metabolism and fatty acid metabolism. The bottom line is in most of our chronic diseases are driven by changes in fatty acid metabolism or cholesterol metabolism and sugar metabolism. So that's why we got very excited about what's going on. So these are four different groups of mice. The bottom line is if you look at under high fat diet at libitum, many of these metabolites, particularly sugar metabolites, are pretty low and uh, these are actually good metabolites for sugar and those are increased under time restricted feeding. And conversely, in high-fat diet, if we just give food only for eight hours, then these metabolites are these fatty acids, which are very harmful, actually reduced. And heat maps don't give you the actual magnitude of change. And to show how different these changes are, these are essentially eight different time points for each group. And you can see, for example, coenzyme A goes up and down by almost 40-fold, depending on time of the day. So this also has huge implication for people 
uh, who are interested in looking at metabolites in human samples or in animal samples, depending on the time of the day, many of the metabolites will change significantly. So that's why controlling simply for time of day when you're doing analysis is very important. And if we just map them on non-metabolic pathways, this big metabolic pathway charts that you see once in a while on wallpaper, and then uh, put the genes that are involved in this metabolism, then almost all these green ones are the genes, and then the black ones here are metabolites. All of these actually change on a daily basis based on whether the mice eat uh, on a time-restricted or ad libitum fashion. So the summary of this first paper was the body fat reduced, body weight reduced, blood sugar and blood cholesterol reduced, energy expenditure actually increases under time-restricted feeding, motor control improves and endurance improves. So after this, um, we kind of loosely use this term time-restricted feeding without knowing that this would actually take off. And now TRF has, or TRE has become a standard term in many websites. Uh, so the concept is timing of food access is restricted, no overt attempt to restrict calorie or change nutrition. And this is just an experimental model in animals and it can prevent obesity and metabolic disease in many different uh, conditions. So then there are a lot of different questions. One was whether it's therapeutic. Of course it was preventative. Can, is it therapeutic? Is eight hours a magic number or can mice eat for nine, 10, 11, 12, or 15 hours? And um, is it effective against other nutrients? For example, high fructose, high sucrose, high cholesterol diet. So to test this, we went back to the vivarium, had uh, nearly 600 mice in different cohorts. So we tried either high fat, high sucrose, or high fructose diet. And then to test whether eight hours is a good number, we tried nine, 12, and 15 hours. To see legacy effect or reversal, we actually fed mice time restricted for five days, and two days they had off, so they could binge it in the weekend. And then we also did the classic crossover where they were time restricted initially and not live uh, in the second half or vice versa. So the bottom line is all these cohorts ate the same amount of calories uh, from the same food source. Um, and in fact, the mice that eat binge it over the weekend, they eat more than mice that eat ad libitum throughout the day, throughout the week. Uh, so the bottom line is when we put time restricted feeding on any cohort, then the body weight reduces, and most of the body weight reduction is due to reduction in body fat. So that's the MRI body composition analysis of all these mice at the end of the experiment. And again, uh, this nine hours and 12 hours time restricted feeding works. Even five days of time restricted and two days of binge eating was preventative, although these mice ate more than ad libitum fed mice. And 15 hours actually doesn't work that well, and this is the most important experiment where we actually are lip fed mice for up to 26 weeks. These mice become really big. 55 grams of mice is not a, <laughs> not a small thing. And then if you put them on time restricted feeding, they'll lose nearly 20% body weight within the next uh, 12 to 13 weeks. And if we do the experiment early on in their life, we can completely reverse the body weight. And conversely, if the mice were actually healthy, they were time-restricted fed up to 26 weeks, they rapidly gain weight when they go back to ad libitum. So that means there is no legacy effect. They have to be on this time-restricted eating pattern. If the mice had normal diet, although you don't see much body weight difference, what is interesting is if you look at their muscle mass, mice on normal diet, they increase their muscle mass much more than any other group. So. Uh, then the question is, is it only on liver and muscle that the effect is? And in fact, the effect is uh, pervasive. This is white adipose tissue, and these are all inflammatory macrophages getting into white adipose tissue under our lip fat condition, and those disappear. In brown adipose tissue, we see browning of brown fat, so that means these mice actually produce a lot of heat. They literally burn uh, the fat, and in fact, that's what we see in the VO2 consumption rate. And now I'll focus on only three parameters. As I told you, cholesterol, free fatty acid, and, and blood glucose, those three are drivers of health and disease. And the bottom line is, under time-restricted feeding, we do see serum cholesterol always drops. In fact, this is almost a biomarker of time-restricted feeding for us now, uh, because any genotype of mouse we put on TRF, we see this uh, reduction in uh, serum cholesterol. Uh, the same thing happens with uh, liver. Uh, triglyceride or liver-free fatty acid, there is actually a much bigger drop in liver-free fatty acid than in the serum triglyceride. And uh, that's expected because the serum triglyceride is 
tightly controlled, it doesn't fluctuate as high as in liver triglyceride. And the blood glucose, again, we see postprandial blood glucose response is typically attenuated under time-restricted feeding. Um, so finally, you might ask, well, these mice are fasting for 16 hours or 12 hours. Are they healthy? Can they actually do uh, stay on treadmill, or can they lift weight? And in fact, the grip strength, which is equivalent to lifting weight, doesn't change. They, are, they can lift as much weight as normal childhood mice. But what is interesting is this. If you put a mouse on treadmill, this mouse will run for 75 minutes if they ate standard diet. If they eat high-fat diet, they run only for 50 minutes. Of course, their performance is reduced. But if they eat the same high-fat diet under nine hours or 10 hours, they actually outrun the normal child-fed mice by almost double the time. And this was always surprising. And this effect happens only when they eat nine to 10 hours. If they eat the same diet for 12 hours, that effect goes away. So uh, going back to the mice, what we find is the nine hour eating or 10 hour eating slightly increases uh, ketone bodies. And this is what nutritionists usually discard because this is a very small increase. But we think that small increase every day is driving this um, um, exercise performance. Uh, so the bottom line is uh, time-restricted feeding is uh, preventative and therapeutic, but it uh, doesn't have legacy effects. So that means if you have this fat mouse going into time-restricted feeding can lose weight, but if the, lose, if the lean mouse goes into ad libitum feeding, then it will actually gain weight. Um, so then the question from reviewers was, well, mice are nocturnal, humans are diurnal, maybe this is a nocturnal animal phenotype. Uh, so that's why we stepped down, <laughs> we went to flies, and then we did time-restricted feeding in flies. So flies actually eat during daytime, and if we do time-restricted feeding, then we feed them only for 12 hours, they eat the same number of calories, and flies do gain weight over <laughs> five weeks, and these TRF flies don't gain weight. And they actually have the same amount of activity, but what is interesting is they get into deeper sleep. So every day, by five weeks of age, most of the flies throughout the world who are living in these small vials, they barely sleep for three to four hours. But if you time restrict them, only during the daytime, they have good night sleep, they can sleep up to six to seven hours during nighttime. And what we find is this increase in sleep is only due to change in arousal threshold. So that means they get into deeper sleep and they don't get disturbed by other flies uh, flipping their wings nearby. Um, but what is most exciting for us was we could actually go and uh, quantitatively assay Drosophila heart function. So Drosophila heart is very similar to human heart in development and function. The only difference is it's uh, different in structure. And the nice thing is you can decapitate a fly, open up the body cavity, and monitor the beating heart for up to 12 hours. And that gives us enough um, time to look at how the fly heart works. Okay, so it's playing the video. So this is the type of um, video that we see. We take one pixel width of this image and then line them up right next to each other to get what we call an M-mode image. And these, from these M-mode images, we can extract many parameters. For example, we can get diastolic diameter, systolic diameter, diastolic interval, systolic interval, heart period, and then arrhythmicity index and fractional shortening. All the seven parameters parallel very well human heart condition. And in fact, as flies is, just like as we is, these seven parameters change in a very predictable fashion. So then we asked how time restricted feeding affect these seven different parameters. So I showed you the video of how the early fed fly is at three weeks. And now let's look at how the heart actually functions at five weeks of age, which is around middle age, 45 to 50 years for a human. And you can see the heart is very arrhythmic it barely beats sometimes, and you would wonder whether the fly is still alive. And the flies ate only for 12 hours every day, then we'll see how the heart beats. And this is fairly regular. Actually, they have very little arrhythmic index. So in fact, we do this at uh, different ages. So the bottom line is we can slow down fly aging heart by almost two weeks, which is around 30% improvement in their aging rate. Uh, so they age slower. So with that, we went back to mice and asked a similar question. A high cholesterol-fed mouse is a very nice model for atherosclerosis, 
So we took this mice, LDL receptor knockout mouse, and then gave a diet that had 1.25% cholesterol by weight, which is very high. And uh, just like in other strains, we do see, although they eat the same number of calories, they actually weigh less. Most of the reduction in body weight is due to reduction in fat mass, and actually LDL receptor knockout mice gain a lot of um, muscle mass. And just like in other experiments, they also gain this treadmill performance uh, if they eat for eight to nine hours. And the most exciting thing is we can actually reduce atherosclerotic plaque in the aorta by almost 40% if they ate the same high cholesterol diet but ate it within eight to 10 hours interval. So in summary, from mouse and flies, we found many different uh, um, benefits of time-restricted feeding. Actually, I didn't talk about dysbiosis. One big thing about dysbiosis that we find in TRF mice is at least in mice, fiber is digested in the upper intestine and is absorbed, whereas under time-restricted feeding, for some reason, fiber actually gets to the cecum, and that's where it's digested, but there is no good absorption of sugar, so these mice actually excrete some free sugar in their stool. So in that way, TRF reduces absorption of blood uh, sugar from nutrition. And it also changes the, blood mi uh, sorry, the gut microbiome in certain way, so that um, the bile acid metabolism is changed. So with this, uh, then we asked, well, can we go back to this hypothesis? Um, does eating time matter in human? And actually, over the last several years, we have seen a lot of uh, papers coming out in top journals in circadian rhythm, and most of these studies, many of them actually relate to uh, mostly model organisms. So, and particularly, when it comes to nutrition and circadian rhythm, nearly all of them were model organisms. So that's why we started from scratch. One thing we realized is in many nutrition research, people are asked, what do you eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? And they're rarely asked, what time did you eat what? So to get that timestamp, we actually wrote a very simple app. Uh, this is a very old version of the app. And the bottom line was, we have to make the app as simple as possible, just like Amazon checkout, one-click checkout. Uh, so one click was to open the app, second click was to take a picture of the food that the person was eating, and then the third click was to save. And they didn't have to annotate what it is, they didn't have to say how much they ate, but in case they forgot, they could actually go back and text it or um, select from the menu. And so in that way, we transferred the burden of annotating food from the user to the researcher. And with that, we actually we uh, recruited around 156 adults who were non-shift workers and not related to anyone in UCSD Salk or any pharma company in, uh, in San Diego, and they were not, also not related to them. And we asked them to record everything that they ate or drank for three weeks, because we know the eating pattern changes from week to week. And we had some um, error estimation approach. So for example, every day we would send at random time, a very simple push notification, did you eat or drink something in the last 30 minutes? They have to just say yes or no. And then we compare the response with what, whether they recorded anything or not. And from there, we got the error estimate of 10%. So that means 10% of the time, they ate or drank something but forgot to log. And um, so we got nearly, people actually logged all types of food. Uh, so these are the pictures, random pictures of people logging food. And as you can see, for some of this food, it will be extremely hard for them to actually pull a food name and then find how much quantity they ate. And they won't be actually inspired to log that. But taking picture was very simple. So we got nearly 26,000 entries, out of which 20% uh, were water and 28% were prepackaged food. So we could actually extract the nutrition information easily. And then 50% were mixed meals, so that's where we used multiple approaches. We put the pictures in Amazon mTORC, and also we had three independent researchers. They independently assessed how much calories were there. On an average, they ate nearly 1,945 kilocalories, which is very similar to what you would expect. But again, we had 10% false reporting, so we know that they were eating more than that. And just the act of recording data did not change their BMI over three weeks. Um, and then the question is, how do you represent this data? Timing of food information. So what we do is we, we plot them along timeline and we call it feedogram. So we also estimated that it takes on an average 14 minutes to finish an average meal or average snack. 
So that means within 15 minutes, if somebody is um, uh, sending multiple pictures, that is considered as one eating event. So this is someone's pedogram over three weeks, and it's really random. And those are the weekday and weekend um, eating events. And if you look at it, then you can begin to see how the eating pattern is between weekday and weekend. And now if you combine this and then plot it on a radial plot, this is 21 days of data from one individual. And it goes from the top one is morning 6 a.m., that's noon, and then uh, this is evening and midnight. These are 156 people's data over uh, three weeks. So as expected, the number of events uh, peaks around 1 o'clock when people eat their lunch, and again around 7 or 8 when they eat their dinner. And the number of calories per event actually peaks predictably, but the midnight snacks are very dense in calories. Um, so since we had the uh, timestamp, we can also go back and see what kind of food people prefer to eat at what time. And now we can actually go back and see in which zip code what people prefer to eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I'll just draw your attention to one thing, that's the uh, drugs. I think, I'm not sure whether the drugs are here. Yes, medications and supplements. Um, what we find is people f remember their medication only during breakfast and just before going to bed. Why this is important is nearly 70% of FDA-approved drug targets are circadian. So that means the efficacy of a drug is strongly modulated by time of the day when the drug is taken. And in fact, in animal models, we can show that a drug can be therapeutic at a certain time and can be toxic at another time. So in future, it will be interesting to go back and look at these drugs and compare what time the target is peaking or is at its trough and what time they're taking the drug. So now the question is, how do you figure out now eating pattern and can you, can you express it in one, um, very, one parameter? So the way we define eating duration is the interval in which 90% of food over two to three weeks is consumed um, so that means if a person actually starts eating from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., that's the 90% interval, then there will be around uh, 15 hours interval. And what we found among these 156 people, 50% of adults eat for 15 hours or longer. And in animal experiments, if these animals are given 15 hours of fatty food or high fructose diet, then they would become, they would become sick. Then the question is how people eat during weekday and weekend, since uh, we actually gave them another active watch that they were wearing, so we can figure out what time they woke up, what time they went to bed. The bottom line is in the weekend, people actually delay their breakfast by up to two hours. 25% of people delay their breakfast by two hours. How does it, wh why does it matter? Just like our brain has a clock, and when we travel over two time zones, we, our sleep-wake pattern gets disturbed. When we eat breakfast two to three hours later in the weekend, we suspect that our liver clock gets disrupted and we don't even uh, feel it that easily. And the dinner time actually doesn't change over the weekend. Now you can ask, since we had the food, um, the time stamp and the calorie content, we can ask another question. By noon of every day, what percentage of daily calories is consumed? And it's only less than 25% of the calories is consumed by noon. Why this is important is our body is most efficient in digesting food. The insulin response is much better in the first half of the day, and that's when we are consuming less food. And by evening, we consume nearly 62% of food, and the first three hours of evening, we consume more food than in the first six hours or seven hours of the day. So this is the worst time to eat food, and we actually consume a lot of food in the evening. Okay, so then we also have the timestamp of when the person woke up and when the person actually had the first calorie. And if we look at that, as soon as we work, wake up, within one hour of waking up, 80% of people eat or drink something that has calories. And within two hours of before going to bed, 50% of people eat or drink something. So the bottom line is, as long as our eyes are open, our mouth is open. And um, there is a trend in how this eating pattern changes over age and also in, in different ethnic background and different BMI. I won't go into detail. We did a similar study in India and we find very similar trend. And in fact, in India, nearly 60% of people eat for 15 hours or longer. So the eating duration is much longer because people wake up early and also they go to bed very late. Another interesting thing that we found in India 
is although we excluded shift worker, we found people who are eating very randomly throughout 24 hours. And when we went back and asked, they said they don't do shift work, but their spouses do. So that means there is a lot of secondhand shift work that goes on in the society that's not counted by DLS, Department of Labor Statistics. That's another thing that we have to uh, uh, keep in mind. So then the question is, does BMI correlate with eating duration? The answer is no, it doesn't correlate because BMI is a very complex uh, outcome. But we asked a different question. If a person has a BMI of above 25 and eats for 14 hours or longer, can we change eating pattern? And is it a modifiable behavior? And if they do modify the behavior, does it have positive outcome? Uh, so the bottom line is, uh, can we actually shrink this human? And so we took um, eight subjects. This was very preliminary pilot study. And we asked them to eat only for 10 hours every day for 16 weeks. Uh, they could eat whatever they want, how much ever they want. They just have to eat for self-selected 10 hours. So this is a pedogram during baseline, and this is a pedogram of the same person during intervention. And you can see that the person actually changed its uh, eating interval. So these are the eight individuals that chose different time of the day, depending on their lifestyle. The bottom line is, after 16 weeks, they lost nearly 3.8% of their body weight. They're not super obese, but they're overweight. What is exciting is, between 16 weeks and one year, we actually let them lose. There was no contact with them. And at one year, they still maintain that body weight gain, a loss. And when we asked, why did you stick to this eating pattern, the surprising thing was, it was not due to body weight loss. They said they slept better and they felt more energetic throughout the day, and that drove the behavior. So it's possible that sometimes, your target outcome may be one thing, but what they feel on a daily basis may be something else that drives the behavior. So in summary, although these people reduce their um, eating interval to 10 hours, it's actually not mechanistic because many of them reduce their caloric intake also by 20%. So it remains inconclusive whether time restriction or caloric restriction cause this outcome, but if TR leads to CR, then who cares? Means if they can improve, if they can reduce calorie by this way, then it's much better. So right now, we have actually expanded this study. Previously it was only in iOS, now it uh, runs both on iOS and Android. People have to go to this website called My Circadian Clock because we wanted to reduce the number of people who just impulsively download an app and never use it, but according to HIPAA law, we have to maintain their privacy. Uh, so after the sign up, uh, they have to answer a few questions. We send them their informed consent by, mail, by email, and then they also get activation code. They start uh, logging. Uh, so we get, so the first study was done very locally, and now we have participants all over the US and also actually all over the world. And hopefully, we can collect enough data to inspire at least other researchers to start looking at when people eat and how it relates to their health. And with that, I'll stop and take some questions. Thank you. Hi, Josh Anthony, Campbell Soup Company. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. If I was tracking your last study, I understood that with time-restricted feeding, irrespective of the time selected, if you know, eating within a 10-hour period, you, you saw good results. Have you done any work to kind of look at the interaction between sort of the, you know, the chronobiology aspect and time-restricted feeding? That is so that if, you know, for people that selected within, you know, yeah. 10 hours during light cycle, were their results better than those that selected, say, 10 hours in, the, you know, what would be our dark cycle? Yeah, so we haven't done the studies ourselves, but other people have done. Um, in many weight loss studies, people have gone back and retrospectively looked at when people reported their lunch or dinner, and what they're finding is people who eat later in the day, um, even though they're trying to lose weight, they have a poor outcome uh, than people who eat earlier in the day. And that makes sense based on insulin response being circadian and melatonin having an interaction with insulin system. So the takeaway, if you can restrict it during the day, you're going to be better off. Yeah, restricting any time is better, <laughs> and then if you want to go to the better goal post, then during okay. the day is better. Michael McBurney, DSM. Very interesting. Um, we see lots of articles now uh, 
talking about sleep and sleep length related to health and body mass. So do you think measure of sleep is a marker of fasting or non-eating? And do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, so there are two aspects. One is uh, sleep can be an indirect marker of how long people are eating. Um, but there are some very nice controlled studies uh, done where uh, if an individual is habitually sleeping, say, eight hours, and they are forced to sleep only for five to six hours, then um, they, they, of course, they will try to eat because our body reacts, will say, well, uh, you are staying awake, so you need some energy, and these people will eat. But what is interesting is the amount of calories we eat to account for that reduction in sleep time oversuits what is required to stay awake. So that means our hunger and satiety system somehow doesn't work properly to stop when to stop, and those guys overeat. So there may be two different aspects. Um, they may be overeating to compensate for this awake time. My question is actually a little bit related to Mike's question. Um, so first of all, thank you, great, great talk. Um, so my question, so first I had a comment because I think David Dinges from the University of Pennsylvania has a lot of evidence to substantiate uh, the pilot study that he has because he looked back at all the studies they've done on shift workers and sleep and he has 20 years of data showing that the people who didn't sleep enough and ate actually and extended their eating period or gaining more weight than the others. So yeah. you, could, <laughs> you, could, you could be, uh, even if your study, your pilot study was not conclusive, I think there are others, yeah. uh, especially David Dinges, who could substantiate a lot of uh, your uh, own hypothesis. Uh, and second, uh, to elaborate on Michael's question, I wonder if it's not, if, like, if it's not an interplay between the two, because the hormones that actually the, uh, dictate like the satiety, etc. They are also involved in the sleep and the quality yeah. of sleep. So I'm wondering if there is any benefit into doing a study that is looking at the time, the duration of the eating, and also at the duration of the sleep and the quality of the sleep, mm -hmm. and whether some collaboration with the sleep researchers could actually enlighten us a lot in terms of what's going on there, because uh, it's. It's the same body that sleeps and eats, so it, yeah. there's pro it's probably not independent factors. Yeah, you are right on, because the orexin system does regulate both hunger, satiety, and sleep. Uh, it's not only CNS, a lot also happens in periphery. For example, a um, lot of our uh, human volunteers who try to eat within, say, 8, 10, or 12 hours, um, one thing that they always report um, is the acid reflux goes down. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. And if you think, a lot of people actually s cannot sleep or wake up in the middle of the night because of gut problem. Mm -hmm. And by reducing eating duration, if you increase, if you improve gut health, that also helps sleep better. Um, so it's kind of a chicken and egg story because <laughs> if they eat within a certain number of hours, they're sleeping better. And conversely, if they sleep better, and sleep longer, they also automatically reduce their eating duration. Yeah, so yeah. um, obviously these two interact, and gut might be another axis through which they interact. Thank you. Um, Teresa Davis from Baylor College of Medicine. So I have two questions. One, in that last study that you described where people were asked to eat within the 10-hour period, do you know if their caloric intake within that study was similar? Um, and the second question is, do you know about how, within that 10-hour period, how, for example, the protein was balanced throughout the day? Because we know from recent studies that if protein intake is more equally balanced throughout the day rather than the small protein in the morning and a lot of protein in the evening, the way people typically eat, that protein mass is better preserved in older adults. Yeah, so going back to the first question, uh, I think in my last slide, I had, oh, sorry, it's a few slides ago. Um, in fact, when they reduced the eating time duration, they also reduced calorie, and for various reasons. One is most of the caloric reduction happened from, say, alcohol and late night dessert, uh, because they cannot eat or drink that. So in that way, 
we achieve two things, reduction in calories and improvement in overall nutrition. Second thing that happens is since they go through almost 14 hours of fasting and in the morning they are well prepared to eat a breakfast, they actually have a bigger breakfast than before. And breakfast is the, uh, in what we see, breakfast is the meal on which individual has complete control because once you get out of the house, it's hard to control your nutrition. So what happens, not only they increase the size of the breakfast, the quality of breakfast also improves. So this is an interesting approach that you change timing and they automatically change many things that are desirable from nutrition point of view. Coming to your second question, since we see on a population level people are eating very less before noon, whether it's protein, carb, or fat, it doesn't matter. If we can change that equation so that, as I said, if they have longer fasting and have a bigger breakfast, automatically they will increase their protein intake in the morning. So I think this might be an indirect way to achieve some of the stuff that nutritionists have been trying to do. Thank you. Chosan Ku with ILC North America. Sachi, um, based on what you know about circadian rhythm, for somebody who is a diabetic, what is the best time for them to have the carbohydrate uh, intake? Uh, in terms of how should they spread it out? That's a very tough question because <laughs> whatever I will answer is uh, based on my guesstimate. Um, if you're talking about type 2 diabetic, then even in type 2 diabetic, there is still a circadian rhythm in insulin response. So in that way, uh, shifting more of that food towards the morning is desirable. And in fact, uh, we have a few type 2 diabetic, and in fact some type 1 diabetic with insulin pump who are trying to do TRF, and they always report that if they eat later into the night, then their insulin is more out of control. So um, I think even bringing that to as early as a last meal before 6 or 7, is much more desirable. Um, but these are all anecdotes, and we still have to wait to see a real well-controlled study, clinical study. Okay, we'll just this do It's just so interesting, more. Um, raises many questions. There's some people that get up and may have a cup of coffee, but they don't actually eat breakfast for several, or their first meal for several hours. Um, have you looked at whether activity followed by, you know, that 14 hours being, you know, 18 hours into your day, does that make a difference or not? Yeah, so this is a question that comes up very frequently. Um, so there is an, so in our study, we actually counted uh, coffee as calories uh, for many reasons. One is since they were just taking a picture, we could not figure out whether it had sugar or not. Right. So we erred on the other side. Um, but there is a very nice study uh, from Ruth Patterson who went back, looked at enhanced data, retrospective data on women's health, and she discounted coffee. So coffee doesn't count as calorie. And in her study, um, she, what she found is women who fast for 13 hours overnight, um, they have much lower breast cancer risk than women who eat for more than, say, 11 hours and fast for less than 13 hours. And then in a second study, women, uh, breast cancer patients who are going through treatment, if they fast for 13 hours or longer, then they have much better prognosis. So those two analyses are done, discounting coffee, whether with or without sugar and cream, uh, sugar and cream. So in that way, at least there is some benefit of fasting with coffee. Um, but in terms of really going into nitty gritty detail, if you want to get the maximum benefit, then again, we have to think about, it. we have to do a good study. Thanks. Hi, Stella Volpe, Drexel University. Nice presentation. Two part question. One is sort of going off of your son's um, question is that, did you measure diet quality at all? And then secondly, did you also measure whether, for example, they had more protein in the morning or more, more carbohydrate or combination? So I realize that, you're, I mean, this work is great and it's so interesting, but I don't know, did you do those next step yet or, the steps yet or have others? And yes. also activity level because yeah. people who are high, more highly active would eat more and perhaps later in the night than others who are less active. Um, 
due to their activity? Um, so, sorry to your about first, that, like three to, questions. Yeah, so to your first question, uh, we did not look at nutrition quality or uh, because once you include that in the manuscript, then the reviewers will ask for interaction and we are not powered for that. So that's why we stayed away from that. Uh, but now there are, uh, we are not the only ones. There are at least seven or eight different clinical studies going on in Australia, Europe, and US. To our knowledge, there may be more. And they're doing a much better job in looking at nutrition quality and timing interaction. Um, activity. Uh, we actually had an active watch on many of the participants, so we have activity data. What is interesting is after they do TRF, since they're feeling more energetic throughout the day, and particularly the middle-aged and older adults who have a little bit of um, knee problems or a little bit of pain, that pain goes away because of reduction in systemic inflammation. Mm -hmm. So their activity level uh, increases slightly, so it's very hard to say. Uh, but coming back to your last question, evening activity and late night eating, actually we are more prone to, we are more designed to be more active towards the end of the day. And that activity, just among normal people, I'm not talking about people who are going to gym and running for one and a half hour, two hours. For normal people, it's not a big deal if they stop eating around six or seven, because that will actually take care of their sugar much better. Uh, so we haven't gone into looking at high-intensity athletes who do intense activity towards the end of the day and how is their body composition affected. Thank you. All right, this will have to be the last question, and I'm going to let Chuck go because he's a toxicologist. <laughs> Well, if I'd have, uh, last night I didn't recognize you, and we'd have had a totally different conversation over dinner. <laughs> I've been a fan of your work for years. The, um, going back to, I'm a toxicologist, and uh, caloric restriction back about 20 years ago was uh, really opened eyes to many when uh, we found that, for example, 70% of the liver could be removed and later challenged with a chemical a uh, hepatotoxicant that uh, the animal would survive. There would be little injury and that this could be replicated through dietary restriction. Uh, by limiting number of calories, an animal can uh, survive a chemical insult much easier. And as a lot of new research has shown that um, there's decrease in disease with uh, people at, under caloric restriction, and now it's been used as possible therapy with, um, for treating breast cancer. I'm curious as to uh, other interventions as well, as, for example, after, as treatment for various um, toxicities, has that been considered? Yeah, so. I would give you two parts answer. One is uh, many of the caloric restriction studies in rodents and higher animals are actually time restriction as well. In fact, there is a very recent paper in cell metabolism showing if um, CR is done on mice, usually the way CR is done, you give 70% of the ad lib diet at a certain time of the day. And in most laboratory, it's around in the afternoon, five o'clock. And mice eat that food within three hours. So they are actually on a three hours time restriction. So now if you replicate the same three hours time restriction or caloric restriction in morning versus evening, the morning fed mice who are eating during daytime, they do not lose weight even though they're calorically restricted. Only the evening fed mice lose weight as is reported by many CR studies. So it'll be interesting to go back and do the toxicology to see whether the day-fed mice are more or less resistant to, relative to night-fed mice. Then coming to uh, time restriction, we actually don't have the answer whether they will metabolize much better or worse. But what we do see is um, there are a lot of CYP7, uh, cytochrome P450s that are strongly circadian in liver and the amplitude of oscillation goes up under time-restricted feeding relative to ad libitum feeding. So based on that, I would suspect that they can metabolize or break down toxic products much better um, than ad lib fed mice. And in fact, 
cholesterol breakdown by cytochrome P450, CYP7A, CYP7B is pretty high in this TRF mice, and that correlates very well with uh, hepatic cholesterol being broken down to bile acids in these mice. So I would suspect they will be much better resistant to toxins. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just curious. Uh, one short thing. Uh, back about eight years ago, you had said that you only ate between eight and eight. Um, uh, do you still recommend a certain times, uh, time limit for <laughs> caloric consumption? No, I, I mean, uh, we have very limited data to recommend anything, um, but you can take away from this um, presentation and try on yourself because a lot of people <laughs> try it and then come back and tell me whether they had benefits or not. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you.